So, so uh, <clears throat> task and motion planning is actually, uh, well, let's see. It's, it's a place that I think I would like to grow the class. I'd like to make, maybe even move this up in the syllabus into uh, some of the more core material because I think if you have this in your toolbox, then you can program more and more complicated things. And uh, uh, you know, the state machines that some of you have been using will get you so far, but not to loading a dishwasher, for instance. Uh, it's also a, a topic that there's some really good research being done on campus. So Leslie and Tomas uh, in CSAIL are, are leaders in this field, and uh, Brian Williams also, who's in AeroAstro and CSAIL, uh, does some really nice work on, on a version of this problem. So there's a lot of expertise on campus if you get excited about these kind of topics. Okay, so let me try to uh, set it up relative to what we've talked about before, and then uh, remember the plan is for me to talk for the first half and then Boyan's gonna talk for the second half, so I'll try to not talk too long. Uh, <clears throat> so remember I used this as the example to motivate task level planning before. When we were trying to load the dishwasher, this is, if you, now that you've seen it and now you've thought about it, think about writing a state machine that would think about all the possible cases that this system might have to potentially be in, right? Maybe there's plates on top, maybe there's mugs on top, maybe there's the dishwasher's open, maybe it's not. It would blow the stack. You'd have a, an enormous state machine. And the way that the size of the state machine tends to grow as the number of tasks accumulate and the number of possible transitions accumulates, it can grow very, very badly, okay? So, <clears throat> In that project, we did not write a big state machine. We didn't write a big behavior tree. We used planning. And just to remind you that the, the way it looked back then was we defined task level actions, right? And they were finite. There was, a, there was a list of things that we programmed the different skills or different actions that would do things like open the dishwasher door, close the dishwasher door, start the dishwasher. We even loaded a soap packet if we needed to, okay? Um, <clears throat> and each of those was implemented in this sort of abstract class of an action primitive interface, okay, which had just a few sort of reasonable is candidate, get outcomes. We'll talk about those again in just a minute, okay? What's interesting is to, so let's just think about is candidate for a second. So asking, could I run this skill right now? Or more carefully, if, if I was in this state, could I run this skill? That's potentially a very advanced query of trying to understand when, you're, when it's suitable to be, you know, to try to open the dishwasher door could involve, you know, solving intelligence or something. This is, <clears throat> um, but in this context, we have simplified the problem down so that the state is actually a, a discrete finite state. Even though the problem is very complicated, um, we, in that example, coded the state of the dishwasher as things like the number of clean items we've already put away, the number of, um, there's a few things that are more continuous valued, but they were still sampled in a, in a sort of slightly subtle way. But mostly I want you to think about this at the high level, that those choices were enumerated into a discrete set and we could do search on this task level objective primarily with graph search a more advanced form of graph search and, and incremental type of graph search, but we roughly turned this into a big graph search problem in order to decide what we were gonna do next, okay? Um, you know, there was really enumerate, explicit enumerations, enums of the different states that the system could be in, okay? <clears throat> and that is an instantiation of this bigger idea from AI planning I, you know, strips is the language we mentioned very quickly before. It really is, it's a, a you know, long-standing tradition of how to write planning problems, planning descriptions, where you can list initial state, goal state, set of actions. For each action, you list the preconditions, you list the effects of the action, and this defines a planning problem. And the, you see the action primitive interface is candidate is exactly the preconditions that you would see from strips and get outcomes exactly represents the effect set of, this, uh, of that action. And just defining that, where the, if you can write the preconditions and the effects on a discrete state space, 
then you're in the land of AI planning and things. Um, and we have very strong tools for that. I mentioned quickly Padiddle before, um, the planning domain definition language, which you should think of as an extension of the strips vocabulary, where there's concepts of like, there's an object-oriented sort of uh, concept in there. There's, um, there's, so there's now then the notion of object instances. It's a more expressive way to write big, discrete planning problems. But it can, if you chose, the winning planners that use PDDL actually do not typically do standard graph search anymore. Um, but you could convert this into a very big graph search and do graph search on it. The winning planners do much more heuristic search on a factorized, uh, exploiting the factorization in the problem. Okay. And then if you have this high level um, planning power, then <clears throat> you can accommodate some of the so you know, we've made it weak in the sense by having to discretize the world into a handful of, of finite buckets, right? And that weakens our ability to describe all the things that could happen in the world. But you can overcome some of that with feedback and online replanning. So in the dish loading example, we would reevaluate our discrete symbol grounding of the world every time we took an action. And if something changed, we could handle unexpected outcomes. So that was the, you know, the example I gave of that is that someone came and um, closed the dishwasher door and it would, it would realize that, realize its preconditions were no longer met, choose a different path through the discrete search base to continue. Okay, so let me transition to that in a second. So there are cases, so, so this, is, this was a case where despite its complexity, we were able to get very far by, by doing things with discrete graph search first, and then filling in the details with motion planning second, and then the, the, the coupling between that, any gaps in the coupling between the discrete planning and the continuous motion planning were overcome with feedback. But there are similar problems where that's not good enough, especially if you have longer term consequences of your actions, that you really cannot decouple the motion planning from the task planning, hence the name of the, le the lecture. So um, Kaylin Garrett, uh, was a recent graduate from Leslie and Tomas's group, had a, no a number of nice examples that told that story. I'll, I'll use one of his here. I think he's talking, but here we go. So imagine we just have a little suction gripper, and the problem was to move the red um, object, or the A, onto the red region, okay? The B, let me do that again. Yeah, movable blocks, placeable regions, okay. There's, if you think about the continuous values of that problem, there's a continuous state that represents the location of the A block. There's continuous state that represents the location of the B block, you know, where they are in the world, where the gripper is in the world. The only reason that you have to move the B block or the A block first, whatever, is because of the continuous location. There was a block in the, that was impeding my ability to solve the simple version of the problem, right? I wanted to just pick up this block and put it in this region. There was a different block that was in the way. Because of its continuous value, I had to make a different set of, I had to order my discrete actions differently. Does that make sense? The coupling between the discrete and the continuous exposed itself that it really affected the, what your first action should be, okay? So the planners, these stronger task and motion planners will solve that harder version of the problem where they jointly solve for the discrete path through the graph and the continuous actions of the manipulator, task and motion planning. Here's another example that, um, let me talk through it again. So this is the PR2 with a, the much loved, no longer with us uh, PR2 that, that Leslie and Tomas used to use constantly. Uh, the PR2 slowly went out of existence. They bought every spare part on eBay possible and uh, they don't, it just, it's not around anymore. But uh, <clears throat> so this task was, is to pour the, 
pour the blue mug, the contents of the blue mug into, I forget if it's the white or the red bowl, but basically pour that out. So you would think the simple strategy would just be, okay, first I have to pick up the mug, then I take it over and pour it. But because of the, um, the location of the green block at the initial time, and the kinematics of the arm, it was impossible to pick up the blue cup from an orientation that would later allow you to pour at an angle that would get it in. But these were the kinematics of the robot, the joint limits, the size of its hand, were affecting the order in which you had to execute things. You wouldn't have even needed to pick the green block if it wasn't for the kinematic limits and the, the, and the continuous variables. Okay, so that's just another example here of See the green block's in the way. Okay, but it, the stronger task and motion planning algorithms will solve that big version of the problem. <laughs> With a sample-based planner, yeah. Okay. So I wanna tell you just quickly the way, so, you know, a couple of the ideas from task and motion planning uh, and make sure I leave plenty of time for Boyan. So there's a nice survey um, that Kaylin and, and company uh, wrote about integrated task and motion planning. Uh, it's not that old, it's still quite very relevant, so I, I'd, I'd strongly recommend it if you wanna get a more encyclopedic coverage of this kind of material. Uh, <clears throat> but actually one of the things that they do in that survey is they make a taxonomy of the different approaches that people have taken to task and motion planning. So TAMP is what all the cool kids call task and motion planning, right? <clears throat> And uh, I think the, the choices they made about the, um, you know, the X and Y axis of the little grid are, are useful to understand. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll, I'll, come, I'll give a couple examples that I hope tell this story uh, clearly, but let's think about sequence first versus satisfaction first. Roughly speaking, if I were to make choices about all of the continuous variables in my search problem, then I can reduce the problem back to a discrete graph search. And that, that would be sort of take the, solve the continuous problems first and then go to, to the discrete, okay? There's similarly, you could try to solve for a discrete path problem, okay, and then try to fill in the details of your motion plan. Now, of course, that's not gonna, because of the task of motion plan and coupling, you can't just fix the high level sequence and then solve for the continuous. But, if, but some of these strategies really dominate by saying, thinking about first, let's pick a discrete set of actions, try to fill in the continuous thing. If I got a, valid, a, a violation, I was not able to find a solution on the continuous problem, then I'll go back and revise my discrete plan. But in some of these, these problems, the discrete rules. People love their discrete planners, they're very strong. Let's try to find a way to jam continuous reasoning into the discrete planners. Similarly, there's some people, and I would probably put myself in the second class, maybe, which is we love our continuous trajectory optimization, right? And we can find ways to jam discrete stuff into our uh, continuous trajectory optimization, okay? And so those are sort of the top and the bottom uh, axes. And the interleaved are the people that are maybe trying to, to do a little bit more of, let's do a little bit of planning, incrementally build my long-term plan, and incrementally call my motion planner, and try to do a little bit more um, explicit coupling, okay? So I thought um, I, would, I would pick two instances here that I are two of my favorites here. So um, the logic geometric programming is people like me uh, that think about trajectory optimization first and try to put some discrete planning into the trajectory optimization framework. And then Padiddle Stream, which was Kalen's work, um, is a little bit, it's, it's interleaved, but I would say it's still coming a little bit more from the sampling first and putting uh, motion planning into the sampler. Okay, let me tell you just a few things about logic geometric programming. First of all, it's awesome. There's, um, there's just very compelling uh, examples. Uh, this one's from Danny. This was actually, you know, follow on work that connected it to perception and other things, but the basic idea that a trajectory optimization is solving for these very, you know, multi-step processes that are making long-term decisions between multiple arms that, that need to coordinate in order to accomplish a task, like that was put the yellow block on the red thing, pretty similar to what we talked about before, right? 
but um, where you had to move block A to get block B there. Um, but these are solving, you know, definitely multi-step handover kind of problems from a description which is uh, not imposing that the, the system must make a handover. That is discovered as part of the sequence is discovered along with the continuous motions. Okay, so I think I could tell you the gist of how that works um, because I've already told you about kinematic trajectory optimization, right? So um, my toy version of kinematic trajectory optimization didn't even have a robot, it just had a, a point that was going around the red obstacle. And we wrote optimization problems which had a cost. In this case, it was just a shortest path kind of cost, even a weird one in the, in the squared, but okay. I started at the X start, my final thing was X goal, and I, that last one is just the constraint that said for all N, I want to be outside the obstacle, right? And more generally, I might write that as um, minimize x0 to xn. And it's important to realize I, I had to make a, a choice on the number of steps I'm, I'm going to optimize over, OK? The sum over n, maybe I've got some, I'll use L for my loss function. And um, yeah, I'll stick with x since that's on the board, but it could probably just be my joint angles, for instance. Maybe it's xn plus 1 um, and xn if I wanted to, to have that n equals 0 to n minus 1, okay. Subject to, um, generally I might have constraints of the form like this. For instance, and then I had my initial condition final condition, right? <clears throat> what logic geometric programming is doing is solving a more complicated version of this, which I would call hybrid kinematic trajectory optimization. Um, there's many different names for it, but if you've taken underactuated, you'll recognize hybrid trajectory optimization. This is a, a long-standing thing from uh, more dynamic systems is hybrid in hybrid systems. Uh, <clears throat> so, but this is a kinematic version of that. Okay. So in hybrid kinematic trajectory optimization, I'll do it in a, in a um, step. Let's call this like, I'll even call this action number one. Okay. And then I'm going to have a second problem, which is action number two. And for action number two, I'll similarly write out my new n decision variables. Maybe it's even m decision variables. No need for them to be the same. And I'll have a loss function that's, you know, L subject to G and subject to x0 equals something, xm equals something, right? Think about it making a, just a complete copy of this algorithm, okay? But perhaps when I'm taking action number two, I'll have a slightly different set of constraints here. Maybe action number one right, represent move the arm without an object. And maybe action number two might be move the arm with block A in the gripper. Okay, so maybe <clears throat> if I know that block A is in the gripper, then I'll have a constraint here saying, for instance, like the Q of my robot or my gripper, you know, equals the Q of block A for all, for all of the, the steps M, okay? And then maybe I've got an action number three, you get the point here, but I've got an action number three, which is move with block B, and I've got all the same things, but 
my G here would say that the Q of the robot has got to equal the location of block B, that block B somehow moves with the robot. So I could solve those if I knew the sequence a priori. I could solve those one at a time. I could say I'm going to move block A, I'll run that first problem, and then I'll stop. I'll take whatever the situation is right now. I'll try to move block B. I'll solve that second problem, right, from the current initial condition. Okay. But if you want to solve them jointly, if someone has told you already, given the sequence, if I said, I want to do a sequence which would be, I'm going to move, let's say, action 0, and then I'll do action 1. I'll move block A, and then I'll do action 0 again, because I need to move my robot over to where the block B is, and then I'll do action 2. If someone tells me what the sequence is going to be, then I could solve that whole problem jointly as a single trajectory optimization problem. Right? Where I could just accumulate all the costs into one big cost for all the problems and add extra constraints saying that x0 from, um, let's, let's say, xn from action 0 has to equal x0 from action 1. Okay? I'll, put con I'll use the constraints of the initial condition of this problem to match the final condition of that problem. I'll take the initial condition of this problem to match the final condition of that problem, right? And I'll just make constraints that link these two together. Is that clear? X n of action 1 has got to equal x 0 of Action zero, second time. And the decision variables that I'm handing to my optimizer now is a sequence of x's for this action, a sequence of x's at this action, a sequence of x's for this action, right? Each of those is a sequence of decision variables that I'm handing the solver. And then I've got a bunch of constraints which allow those optimization problems to couple each other, right? So that the final condition of this matches the initial condition of that, so on and so forth. That's a much bigger optimization problem. It's potentially harder for the solver to, to cope with, but it fits still directly into the nonlinear optimization framework. If someone gives me the action sequence. And that's what you'd call a hybrid trajectory optimization, a hybrid kinematic trajectory optimization problem. Okay, and it turns out solvers can do pretty well with that. You can add, I just use the initial, you know, making the initial and final state match as the only requirement, but you could do more requirements. Like, for instance, if I'm going to pick up the object, if I'm going to transition from moving the robot to picking up the object, then probably the final state of this had better put the robot where the object is, for instance. You can put the necessary constraints that couple those problems that were previously independent into one. Now, why is that better than solving them independently? Because those continuous variables at the interface, if I had to solve this a priori before I even started moving, I would make a, in order to solve this problem, I would have to make an arbitrary choice at the initial location of that object. Or an initial, you know, the, the, I would have to lock in the continuous variables at each of these interfaces. But here it's free to solve for a trajectory only under the constraint, not that it's at a particular goal, but just at, at a goal that's good enough to start up this optimization, that's consistent with that second optimization. Okay, so this is the optimization beginning of task and motion planning. And those problems are well understood and, and, and good, again, if that action sequence is given. Not just, it's, you need to know the number of them, because you need to know how many decision variables, and you need to know the order of them. Okay, the second thing you can do is then formulate, now this is the continuous optimization people sticking some discreteness in, okay? Let's do a search, a higher level search that tries to permute the different possible discrete sequences, okay? And for each of those, we'll solve the continuous optimization problem underneath. And if we're smart about it, we don't have to solve all of the possibilities. We can use bounds on one solution to rule out some of the permutations of this. 
Okay, so we saw that a little bit um, when I talked about branch and bound for, uh, I talked about it only quickly in the trajectory optimization, but there's, for those of you that, that know it, I just want to connect to that, but there's a, a standard approach to, solve, to mixing some of these discrete and continuous optimizations. It's very well understood and gives strong guarantees when the subproblems are convex. That is not the case necessarily in logic geometric programming. Nevertheless, you can, do, um, you, can, you can set up a strategy where you solve a relaxed version of the problem at each time step, and then you try to uh, refine your solution in order to search for this action sequence. That's the discrete decision. And at each level, you're solving continuous optimization problems. So in my mind, what logic geometric programming does very well is it does this branch, it sets up this branch and bound over actions sequences. It, sets, it solves very efficiently the hybrid kinematic trajectory optimization problem. It does use non-convex solvers that are gonna have local minima and everything like that, so there are no guarantees. But in practice, there's a lot of impressive uh, results. <clears throat> and I think the thing, my favorite part of the logic geometric programming approach, um, so when we have done, in my group, mixed integer, branch and bound type algorithms for, let's say, footstep planning of a humanoid, I've been, I think, a little stubborn about saying I want to take the problem instance and I'm going to hand it to Garobi or some, some well-understood solver, and I want to come up with exactly the right problem instance that I can hand to that. You know, there's like a clear problem instance of mixed integer convex. I'm going to formulate that instance. I'm going to hand it over. Mark Toussaint and company, they didn't use Garobi. They wrote their own solver on the end, and they made every, took every advantage of that. Like anything you could do that would avoid solving the big problem downstream, they would take those shortcuts. So for instance, <clears throat> it might be that if action two required solving a kinematic trajectory optimization problem that would say, move my, my bag you know, over to here, I could do an inverse kinematics query and understand very quickly that I can't even reach the bag after action zero, and I don't even have to solve the kinematic trajectory optimization problem. Right? So there's a lot of very clever heuristics in there that leverage the kinematic problem in order to tr prune more and more branches of those trees. And I think that's what made it scale particularly well. Questions about logic geometric programming? This is, I think, one of Mark's favorites, uh, the, you know, Mark Toussaint's favorite version of it, is where he picks up a stick and moves the box over, it's pretty slick. Yeah. There's also one I couldn't find quickly this morning where they, it grabs a hockey stick and like pulls something from far away. That's a pretty good one too. Yes? But for the heuristics that prune the thing, is that, how is that different from just like handcrafting the, like I mean, what, what was described earlier of just like logic systems? Um, okay, so the question is, if I, so I think there are general heuristics just based on geometry, reachability of kinematics and stuff, which feel a little less bespoke than saying, does the dishwasher open at a certain time or something like that? But they still, he still has to define the different actions. And that is the analogy to like deciding that there's a move the mug now. The way that they decide it though is by in the subproblem writing a constraint saying that the pick up the mug action means that the mug is welded to the hand for this part of that, you know, during that action. So the encoding of, of you know, semantics into the optimization happens by the definition of each subproblem. Yes? I guess in this for the example, would there be a need to like take the rack and like put like a stick and use the stick to like let's see. Probably go to the stick is one, move the stick is two, that's and then probably the third one is when it's in contact. I guess three, if I had to get, and then maybe a move away is even four, but small number, yeah. I think these are, these are solving impressive, but maybe not super long uh, duration horizon uh, planning problems. The sequences tend to be, you know, 10-ish steps or less, let's say, not hundreds or thousands. Uh, 
I, the thing I worry about with these kind of uh, methods is local minima. So, I, and I think the branch and bound performance um, will eventually, so, so you can make stronger or you know, less strong branch and bound type approaches, but um, I would worry more about local minima in this. Okay, let me quickly talk about Padiddle Stream, leave time for William. So um, Padiddle Stream is, is a, a different example, okay? So this is now coming more from the sampling, or from the logical planning, uh, symbolic planning side of the world and pushing down and bringing, you know, bringing a few of the motion planning ideas up into the sample-based planning. And uh, it's, so integrating symbolic planners and black box samplers. And I, you know, don't tell Kalen. No, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it in a pretty different way than I think Kalen would talk about it. Uh, so this is just an example of it doing cool things. You know, it's like put all the colored, all the objects in the bowl that is most similar to its color. These are, you know, lo advanced long horizon tasks that they're able to solve with this. But the way I wanna think about it, I hope it's okay. I wanna put it in my language, which is the, the graph of convex sets language, okay? So if you remember, the graph of convex sets was this idea that you could take uh, the standard shortest path on a graph problem and expand its vocabulary by saying every time you visit a convex or a, a, a discrete set, you're allowed to pick one element from a continuous valued function. And we tried to say that the set of those was, was convex. So the shortest path problem, if you say I want to have a source here and a target here, the shortest path might be choose this real value, continuous value, this continuous value, this continuous value, this continuous value. And in the case of a graph search, where we have convex regions, we have, you know, we've been working on ways to make that uh, solve with optimization. Uh, P Padiddle Stream does not make any assumptions about the, sh the convexity of those sets. It's solving a harder problem, and it's doing it with sampling instead of with optimization. And the reason I wanna draw this is because this is how I think about um, the way Padiddle Stream works, okay? So one of the key observations in, in this kind of mixed continuous and discrete planning is this, right? So if you were to give me uh, the path, if you were to tell me already I'm gonna take this path of, of sets, then the optimization problem is easy for us because the, the, it becomes a convex optimization problem. It's only the continuous values that have to be decided. Similarly, if you were to choose the continuous values, the problem is easy, it becomes a discrete graph search. Either one of those is easy, it's only when you put them together that it's hard. What Padiddle Stream is doing, in, in my mind, right, so I have this picture of a, gra of a graph here, right, is <clears throat> it's sampling. So it, it, uh, the streams in Padiddle Stream are samplers, black box samplers. You can think about it for, for any set here, I'm allowed to, every time I evaluate the stream, I pull one more sample out of that, uh, that pot potential set. The samplers, the streams, the samplers that are used in Padiddle Stream are inverse kinematics queries or even a collision-free motion planning. Uh, like GCS, you could say that if I'm in this set, one point in this set might involve, might correspond to an, an entire trajectory uh, of the subproblem. Okay, so what Padiddle Stream does is it, uh, well, let's see, the straw man version of what Padiddle Stream does, which Kalen uses as a straw man, uh, <clears throat> is that you could just pick a bunch of random samples, evaluate your stream 100 times for each set, okay, and then make your edges from all of these points to all of these points, and you have just a really big discrete graph search problem, right? Similarly for all the, the you know, quadratic set of points here, I have to make all the edges here, and you'd get a really big graph search problem. But that would be a way to take your mixed discrete and continuous problem, sample, and turn it into a big graph search, and if you love the power of symbolic graph search, then that can get you far, right? Now, <clears throat> Padilla Stream's much smarter than that. It doesn't do that as the, that would be, you'd add potentially a lot of not only a lot of samples, but a lot of irrelevant samples, right? Because if the optimal path is up here, you're still making a bazillion edges down here. 
So what Padiddle Stream is doing is, a, is, well, there's a handful of different strategies in the Padiddle Stream family, I guess, but they interleave the symbolic planning with the continuous sampling, okay? So basically, think about like an A star type algorithm for graph search would expand only a frontier of possible sets. The high likelihood uh, sets that have a likelihood of getting you to the goal with, with the path are worth sampling more, right? And so you add more samples. Every time you add a new sample, you connect it up with its parents, whatever. You do make the graph much bigger, but you can do selective sampling in order to scale this to much harder problems. And that's what Padiddle Stream is doing. The, each sample, again, would be calling an entire collision-free motion planner, for instance. So it's, you know, doing like this, but it's finding solutions to very, very hard problems. That's it. Okay, so, um, oh, I have to say one more thing. We will soon uh, have uh, GCS trying to solve TAMP problems. That's, that's a, a goal. Sava's here. Uh, this is, think about the, um, let's see, think about, I, I transitioned away, but the, um, the picture of the suction gripper picking up block A, moving to block B. This is just a top-down view, okay? So this is the suction gripper here, the arm, okay? These are the boxes. They have to move from here over to here. That's a combinatorial plus continuous planning problem. And what's interesting is the scale of it is there's lots of boxes and lots of possible permutations, lots of possible paths. And um, there's some you know, initial success suggesting that keeping it in the graph of convex sets kind of framework, we can maybe solve the global optimality with, in, a, in a few seconds. So that's work that you I hope will have a lot to say about uh, soon. Okay, Boyan, let's uh, take over. By the way, I, I appreciate everybody coming. I'm, tell your friends that next semester, Boyan will be presenting for five minutes, at a random five minutes, uh, during every lecture. <laughs> so you must come always to all the lectures to, to see him. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, good, good. Oh, don't pull. There you go. Psst. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second half of the lecture. First, I really appreciate that uh, a lot of people showed up today. What you actually should do is show up in every single lecture so you don't, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about some uh, recent progress in robotic research that is doing planning with large language models. And this is closely related to the uh, advancement in natural language processing. Um, so we've just uh, talked about uh, task and motion planning. Um, but so, and in this, and in task, traditional task and motion planning, we are concerned with problems like those Russ just pre presented. They are more like a, uh, some, some like kind of puzzles that requires a lot of logic and motion reasoning. Well, in this part of the lecture, we are going to talk about what if we plan like humans? What if we have priors about each discrete action, the, the, the description of the tasks? How do we humans plan? So here are some examples. I spilled my drink, can you help? How, how would, if you spill your drink, how would you do it? You will definitely find something to, to, to try to clean it up. You might want to go to the kitchen to find some napkins, wipe it and throw it to the, to the, to the recycle can. Yeah, and also like, so we, want, we all want future robots to help us in daily life and we should be able to communicate to robots and the robots should be able to complete the task we design. For example, when, whenever we want to ask a robot to clean up the spilled coke, the robot sh should, if it's like a humans, it should say, okay, I should complete, generate this sequence of actions and I should try to accomplish them one by one. So for example, you, you may want to, uh, if, it's, if you uh, accidentally spill a coke, you definitely put your coke can into upright position and find some napkins and wipe the table and throw everything away. So it turns out we humans always, um, always love to use language ab as abstractions to specify tasks and to specify plans. 
And when you think about it, you actually, like, when you do like, a, a complicated project, you also communicate with your friends about like, all these kind of plans with language. It turns out uh, humans' acti act activities on the internet produces a massive amount of knowledge in the form of text. And that could be really useful with the power of deep learning. For example, on the right of the slide, you will see if I never, if I don't know how to make certain dishes such as egg fried rice, I'll be able to Google online and they will tell me step-by-step -step instructions. So, um, so before we dive into how we solve these problems, let's, uh, let's talk about large language models. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard of what language model these days and many of you might have played with it. So uh, for those who don't know, I'm going to give you a short introduction. What is a language model? Language model is a task of predicting uh, what word comes next given a context. For example, uh, we have this sentence here that says, the students open there and ask you to predict the next word. And you will immediately have a lot list of candidates in your mind. And if I give you a word, you may say it's likely or unlikely. For example, if I say apple here, open their apple, you will see this is clearly uh, not, not very reasonable and you won't put apple there. Instead, you might put books there because you have all this, you have an internal language model in your mind. More formally, um, it is like given a bunch of words we provided uh, as a context, you will be able to predict the next word, which is x t plus one here. And this is called language modeling. So you can also think this uh, as a system that assigns a probability of a piece of text. Uh, for example, let's say uh, x1 is my first word, x2 is my second word, and if you use uh, all these conditional probabilities, you're able to chain them out together and pr uh, predict the joint probability of, uh, of, uh, of, a, uh, of, of a piece of text that actually makes sense, like uh, that is a probability here, x1 to xt. So how can we use this? So the highlight here is that whenever you have an internal language model in your mind, given some task, given, uh, not some task, but like given a piece of text, you are able to predict uh, what is likely coming up next. So first of all, if you have a fixed list of options, like what Russell said here, like we just assigned a piece of text describing action one, two, and three. Like for example, action one is move the arm without the object, right? Uh, if you have this, already have a fixed list of options, uh, you can use a language model to evaluate its likelihood. For example, if my spilled my Coke and my available actions is like eat an apple, and second option is like find some napkins, you obviously, obviously see that finding napkins is more likely coming up next in the, given the context. So a second way we can utilize this is that if we have, uh, we, we have all the vocabulary uh, in English, so we can actually also sample with our likelihood model. So, so as I showed here, uh, with, a uh, with a trained language model, it will uh, assign a probability to each word in English dictionary. And then you can sample from that distribution and like, uh, generate, uh, generate options. That is how text uh, chatbots works. And you, ac you actually are already using language models every single day. For example, when you type, we, we actually, uh, the, Google knows to suggest you something because, it, uh, because it already have a language model that based on people's history can predict what's likely coming up next. And when you use Google to search, when you type something, it also suggests a bunch of uh, possible options. Then, okay, now everybody knows what a language model is. Then we are going to dive into large language model. So we've already seen a lot of neural networks these days, and many of them we presented this in this lecture are millions of, like, let's say, like a million, five million parameters that are already considered large. But like this really, really large language models of like 540 billion parameters, and you can't use your, your, your tiny GPU, like even with the, <laughs> to, yeah, to, 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 to do even inference on these models. So why do we have this um, huge, language models. It is because if we train them on the entire internet, oh, we can incorporate a lot of human knowledge into them and use them to do uh, interesting things. So for example, you can use large language models to write essays for you. For example, uh, I once wrote a, a, a blog about computer science schools ranked by BOBAs. And this, I actually used a GPT-3 to write, help me writing it because my English is bad. And like this is, one example of how to use it. So you just type in best computer science schools ranked by Boba home blog, 
and write the first sentence, it generates things for you. And it knows that Berkeley has 20 boba shops in front of it. You can also use it to complete your homework, for example, like uh, I, took, I took this as <laughs> I took this essay prompt from, from, from one uh, MIT class that is uh, mind and machi Minds and Machines. And given the prompt, it somehow knows to write something reasonable about that. And uh, I highly suggest everyone to try that. <laughs> and with this, language models can actually also do question and answer in real world. This is a really recent work from OpenAI that's using ChatGPT. So you can ask it, ask it all kinds of questions. Uh, and it can answer really, uh, really well for you. So before, uh, so before the age of deep learning, this question answer models aren't that good. As we dive into the age of getting to the age of really, really big language models, they are getting better and better. Can answer really type of question, uh, all kinds of questions, and actually can relate to previous context as well, and keep, can give you a really realistic experience, just like you are speaking with some humans. This is. Turns out is large language models are really powerful planning. For example, in the most naive way to use this, you can ask it just for a plan of like, how can I do something, right? So give me a list of items I will need to make a cup of coffee, and like it will show you something. For example, um, give me detailed robotic instructions to make a cup of coffee in a kitchen, and it will give you a bunch of instructions. Detailed robotic instructions matter? <laughs> yeah, I still conver uh, converse like a, a human, and I will talk about this problem later on. So, um, so these large language models are really powerful, and we really hope to use them for robotics. So, however, when we I try to use them, so it's ac actually very hard because whenever you ask it to, I spill my drink, can you help? GPT will tell you you cannot. You could try using a vacuum cleaner. Well. Okay, and one funny fact is that when I was doing research uh, as undergrad, like one of my friends was playing with large language models in his project. He asked a, uh, uh, he asked a language model, uh, give me instructions to get a cup of, to, to give me a cup of coffee, and the language model tells him to go to the cafe. <laughs> so this is, you, we need to have more control about what we can get from the large language models to allow us to do uh, actual robotic tasks. And one core challenge is that our robots can only do a fixed number of commands and need, to pro uh, and need the problem broken down in actionable steps. So actionable is critical here. Um, this is not what you, large language models uh, usually output. Um, yeah, for example, in this task, we, we have action one, two, three, and they, uh, there are different skills, but it's three, just three actions. We don't want large language models to up arbitrary things. We want it to choose. Um, so we need large language models to speak robotic languages. So solution one, so we can propose that um, we can just bind each executable skill to some text options, for example, where us already have here is like we have uh, all three actions and we wrote description about that. And if these skills are like actually like real life skills, uh, you can expect the language models to give a reasonable guess about how to, how to uh, guess about like how to generate a sequence of actions like we, what we did here. Um, this is doing the classification, so it's also easier, we have more control. So basically, as we see, language models can predict the probability of like the up upcoming text. So what you do is like you give it like instruction and like you, 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 can, uh, you can evaluate the likelihood, the probability, log likelihood, log probability of each option coming up next in the form of text. So this is exactly what a lot of people tried before. So how, let's say we have a bunch of uh, available options on the, on the right that we can actually use a robot to execute. We, let's say we already call it a skill. We can use large language models to, 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 to complete this just like uh, how we did it in an essay. For example, how would you put an apple on the table and prompt it to say, prompt it to say I would one, and like it will, it will be able to predict a, a likelihood score for each option. There is a second solution, that is we can also prompt the large language model to, out, uh, to output in a more structured way. So not just like random x fry rise instructions that are long paragraphs. So, uh, and then we pass the more structured output because as soon as they are more structured, it's easier for us to pass. 
So then there's come to this important skill called few short prompting of large language models. So what is few short prompting? As we just said, large language models can just finish an essay, like in the, and try to predict the upcoming text in the uh, most likely way. So what if I engineer my context before to, in a structured way? For example, here I, I typed the United States and like I typed some arrows that maps it to Washington DC, the capital, and then one type of food the country is famous for, and the tallest, the highest mountain in this country. So I gave it three examples, United States, China, and Japan, and I prompted to complete the essay for France. And you will see it actually outputted the capital, a food, and the tallest mountain in that country. So that is one of the, uh, so, so, so the highlight here is that uh, large language models can just give them a context, we can, if the context is in a structured way, and can copy the logic and extrapolate to what we are querying next. So this is, go, uh, this, uh, this is called few short prompting. So how can we prompt large language models to do structure planning? Um, so one immediate way to do this is like, I give it a few examples of like uh, a structure plan here, and then I give it new instruction. So I ask it GPT-3 here to generate, uh, generate a plan for bring me a banana from Banana Lounge, and it turns out, okay, I don't, it doesn't have knowledge about Banana Lounge, but somehow like it gives a reasonable plan. We will be able to play, play, play GPT-3 for planning at the end of the lecture if we have time. You will be able to uh, try all kinds of tasks. Uh, okay, so given this, so we already know, now we know what large language model is and how can we use for task planning. Then it remains to combine this kind of new capability um, and connect them to like, make them actually executable in real life. So the first paper I'm going to mention is uh, uh, do as I can, not as I say paper. It is from Google Robotics and Everyday Robots. Um, and so now we know large language models can do planning for robotics. The problem is that large language models are not grounded in real world. They don't know what's actually possible from a state with a given embodiment. So let's say I already have a bunch of skills, let's say, I trained everything either, either with learning or like I have a, I have a motion planning algorithm that can, uh, can, 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 like, can, can give me a plan like given current observation. Like we, we, we have a bunch of skills each tied to uh, uh, a language, uh, language, uh, language description that we can classify from with the thing we mentioned before. So now we have this problem that uh, large language models aren't gr actually grounded in real world. Maybe my language model will say, um, I would like to find, I spill my Coke, and there are, obviously there are a lot of uh, options available. For example, I can either, I can either find some napkins, or I, maybe I need to first go to somewhere else to, to, to find napkins, or like I can also, instead of finding napkins, maybe, Yeah, and um, and maybe you have multiple options that you can uh, that that leads to the su success for completion of the task. However, what's immediately in front of you in front of you may not be uh, may not be uh, valid with respect to every single option. For example, let's say you want to find some you can find pick up napkins directly, but there is no napkin in front of you. Then you shouldn't then you shouldn't execute this task at all. Instead, you should go to find some napkins maybe in the kitchen. And like so, so your plan should should should, um, should also be grounded by uh, gr grounded from, from 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 current state. So, and when we talk about grounded from uh, from from current state, we it's helpful to mention uh, mention a concept called affordance. So, what is affordance? It is saying that with respect to a certain certain task we desire, uh, can I? Uh, how likely it is for me to or like in terms of cost, how, how costly it is, how likely it is for me to accomplish it from my cur uh, current state, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so 
For example, we've all learned a little bit of our reinforcement learning, uh, and we know that what a value function is. Whenever a current state is likely to lead to a uh, higher expected return from the future, when a state is more likely to lead to a, success, com a successful completion of the task, we, we say a current state is of higher value. And in this paper, they use the reinforcement learning uh, in combination with large language models. They first train, uh, train, train uh, reinforcement learning from pixels. Then with the value function from the reinforcement learning algorithm, we can actually calculate if the skill is uh, actually somewhat like executable or likely lead to success from a current observation that is directly from pixels. And um, so I'll provide kind of task-based affordance and they're encoded in the value function. So what we can do is that um, now we have a list of options and, and our language model give us a prior uh, a probability based on, based on the uh, previous context. For example, I, like my, my task, the description of my task and then like what I've already planned before. And then we can also calculate another probability from our current uh, affordance from the value function of the reinforcement learning algorithm. For example, we have a, uh, we can do multiple things at a time. For example, uh, how would you put an apple on the table? Obviously, um, for, for a language model, it seems that find an apple and pick up the apple is, are both valid options. They are both likely coming up in the, given the context of this task. But if I don't have an apple immediately in front of me in my field of view, it will realize I cannot directly pick up an apple at a certain position. So given if we ground, ground decision making by both language models and value functions, we will be able to get a more reasonable guess. For example, if I don't have an apple in front of me, I will prioritize finding apple first instead of picking up an apple directly. Is it harder to learn a value function in the space of words? With the basis function being the language model, for instance? Oh, you mean like state based on? Yeah, yeah. How do you, I mean, learning a value function that works for apples and cokes and all these things seems really hard. Oh, yeah. So, for, yeah. So, so actually, um, I think one, one thing I don't really like about, um, like, uh, one, I won't say won't really like. I think it's one limitation of, like, what the, the vanilla approach in this paper is that they train the separate, you use, they, they actually train it with, uh, imitation learning for many, many of the skills. And like they train one imitation learning policy for every single object. That is, they need some humans to collect the data for like uh, multiple days for your water bottles and for another water bottle, we we'll hire another guy to collect it for another day, something like that. Um, but I think, uh, I think uh, one hope people are, uh, one thing that people, people think they can hopefully solve in the next few years is that instead of doing this kind of thing, we just have one huge value function model that can take in a current image observation and a piece of text embedding and output things. But the problem is that it turns out all this kind of skill learning uh, are in domains where data is extremely expensive. You either hire humans to do it or you train it in simulators like a train store for many, many days to get this kind of thing. So, so yes, it is currently a big challenge right now, and, but like, I think people propose a solution, it is just data is not there yet. <laughs> okay. Ah, so usually value functions is just conditional observation, right? Or actually some, some would say state, right? So it is like they actually have multi, one value function, like the function itself for each of the, uh, each of the skills, options. And then when you, for each of the skills, you look into its value function and you evaluate it by evaluating as a current observation. Yes, yes, so you, in this setup, like you need 50 value functions, although I said in the future, you may just have one that also conditional on text, yeah. Any other questions? Good, everyone is with me.
And then, um, so let's see how does this work. So if, so, so in this slide, the authors are asking you to accomplish some really long horizon tasks that involves like um, nine steps here. And it says, I spill my Coke on the table. How would you throw it away and bring me something to help clean? Um, this looks weird, but like it's, it's kind of deliberate to let the, uh, to, to confuse the robot and um, the robot just can this things accordingly. You will be able to see that at the very beginning, it thinks that it, it, it finds that uh, find the Coke can is very likely uh, in the, uh, in the, in the first, in, at the first step and it's also somewhat, it's also executable because it's navigation, so it just chose that, that, that task. And then, oh, by the way, like the, if you didn't see, the blue, the blue bar indicates the likelihood score from language, and the uh, red bar indicates the likelihood score from uh, affordance. So you will see that, uh, uh, so let's, let's go to the fourth, let's go to the fourth uh, picture. If you look at that, you will realize that uh, the affordance the affordance for down is actually extremely, uh, oh, the affordance for everything else is uh, extremely high. Um, no, sorry, I picked the wrong, wrong one. Let's, let's look at number five. Um, language model might, uh, might, might suggest that uh, actually immediately finish, but like my affordance uh, would suggest that many other options are really, um, really, really av available for me to accomplish. And this kind of, these two things, things together ground a, a entire plan for this long horizon plan task. But do you have to predict the future observations then? No. Uh, so how can you plan, like for the fifth one, if you don't know what the image is at time zero? Oh, uh, ah, I s if it doesn't know the image is uh, at time zero, I think, so I think one, one, one assumption that uh, this type of work often assumes is that your language model is reasonable enough that like your, 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 your plan generated by language model is already reasonable. It is like um, what the language model sees is that at the time step five, it will see human instructions and like a robot, I would find a cold can, pick up the cold can until like step four. And so it kind of sees a history of like a history of, uh, of task plans like before, but not like observations. So this kind of, this somewhat requires the language model to be good. If the language no model is not good enough, you cannot trust it. So um, I guess, same question, but like, the, so are, are you saying that as um, up to three million steps, you don't know what everything in the future would look like? It's just like you don't know what the risks are until, like, unless you have the data, right? So basically, like, I cannot plan for the step after the first step because the Yeah, currently this is the setup in this paper. Although there are future works that improves upon this. Yeah. So nobody asked ask about this, but uh, another another thing people might uh, ask is that how does it incorporate feedback in the scene for uh, for a stronger way? So it is like, uh, for example, if I found certain tasks to be invisible, um, how can I adjust my plan accordingly? So this requires a feedback from a feedback from a step from the environment that is contains requires more information than just affordance. For example, let's say I try to open my door with my key. Then I, I saw my key is in my pocket, but it turns out it's not. So in my in my mind, I kind of know I need to adjust my plan accordingly and replan. So actually, some follow up so uh, follow up works of this have proposed that we can do it, like we can prompt the large language models to to do. Um, to do uh, some interesting uh, inner monologue. That is like, they have a success detector that detects certain expected event actually didn't happen. For example, the fact that my key is in my pocket is not there. Then it will, it will just modify the, modif insert one line in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in the prompt here saying that, oh, I found something, something is not actually there. And then the langu large language model kind of incorporates that feedback and adjusts its plan in the future accordingly. So that is the magic of prompting large language model. Um, another interesting that people always do um, is that, um, you know, language models are very tr tricky and they, uh, they are really naughty. And to make them, to make them, to make them like actually plan good things, sometimes you need to give them some good incentives. 
For example, here I just say, let's say we are trying to accomplish a really, really long horizontal skill. If you directly ask a robot to give it an instruction, it, it will avoid giving you a really good, good uh, sequence of actions. Instead, what you do is like you insert something like chain of thought. You say, now, after like humans, I fill my code, after this instruction, I write this sentence. Let's think step by step, and then generate a plan, and you will find the quality of the plan significantly improves. Another thing is that uh, you can have string of thought, which is saying that instead of saying, let's think step by step, I give a few demos saying that, uh, uh, saying that um, okay, someone spilled my, their Coke, I need to find something to wipe the table, and uh, finally throw everything away. So if you give it a few examples of this, and like now given a new instruction, it will actually learn to follow the structure and generate a chain of thought, a new chain of thought for the new task. And it actually also helps it generate a plan better. So it is really naughty and you need, you need to find, there are a thousand tricks how to prompt it, how to, prompt it to generate nice things. Is it new to this Yeah, in the, in the latest version of the CCAM paper, they added chain of thought uh, where like I, I, I added a line of reasoning in it to help language models do better. So like in this case, you're not saying anything except you do better than like this, but you actually fix the, the possible skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh no, it, it is, oh, so, sorry, sorry, I misinterpreted the question. So, so the point I'm making here is that if we want to add a chain of thought prompting into this, this is a signal to whether we are doing generated planning or classification-based planning. So if you look at this, so, it, so when it came out, it actually really impressed me because um, this make, make a future of like, future of with whom robots more likely? <laughs> because if, sorry. Um, I spilled a drink, can you help with that? Large language models may hold the key to unlocking such tasks. Say can when tasks well, I'm not going to watch the entirety by picking up the coke. Or just look at I the spilled my coke on the table. Demo. How would you throw it away and bring me something to clean it up? The robot considers different skills that are available to it and selects the best one according to the SACAN process described above. It uses the affordance model as well as the language model to score the available options. The algorithm starts by finding a coke can which is then followed by picking up the Coke can. Once the robot accomplishes that part of the instruction, the skill is appended to the prompt and the method continues with the next set of skills. On the right, you can see different skills being considered and their scores by the language model, the affordance model, and the combination of the two. Each skill, once it's chosen and executed, gets appended to the prompt which then allows the model to generate the next part of the solution. In this case, the robot ends by finding a sponge, picking it up, and then in the seventh step of this extended plan, it brings it to the table and puts it down. Since the robot doesn't have the wipe table skill in its repertoire, it finishes the task at this point with a termination. <laughs> Next, we show two other unnarrated examples of tasks that SACAN is able to accomplish. Yeah, so because now the large language models are able to parse really, really complex human instructions, you can see examples here, like uh, you give an instruction like, I just worked out, can you bring me a drink and snack to the cover? So you can, you can input with our hum actually like human language. We are not going to watch the entire video. Let's just assume this is finished successfully. So as you just saw, like, because we want to emphasize the capability of large language models for planning this paper, so we kind of like, we have to have a bunch of uh, uh, skills associated with each executable option. And that is one of the hardest parts that we, I hope, will solve in the next decade. Um, and then I think we can dive into my paper. It's also with uh, robotics at Google and everyday robotics when I was interning. 
So we've just saw Seiken, and it's amazing. But Seiken didn't tell you that they hard coded all object locations. If you move the object a little bit, it doesn't work anymore. Um, and it assumes that all the objects are available in the thing. Um, if you remove something, it will not be able to find an alternative plan. Also, it has no perception. It's like you, 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 you have to let it know that um, where objects are and what objects are available. And by the way, it only can deal with 30, around 30 objects. So this is quite limiting. Uh, and also you need a, and because of this, you have no perception and you have a finite list of executable options. So in this project, I'm trying to significantly expand the capability of SACAN. So previously, as I mentioned, SACAN has no perception system. So it is not grounded with what's in the thing and where they are. So in this project, what we do is like we can just let the robot navigating the thing, uh, look around, find, find all the, take a lot of pictures, and then uh, with the open, voca open vocabulary detector, that is like um, now it, uh, whenever it sees a new image, let's say it saw this bag, this table, it will do this kind of class agnostic regional proposals, um, find, like crop this, this bags and the table out, and store them, store their location, 3D locations, and we do multi-field fusion um, such that we build a scene representation of this entire scene. And then whenever the human asks it about a certain object, for example, I want a bag, and then it will query this scene representation using the visual language models and find its correct location, and also tells me whether it is actually in the scene or not. So, for example, here, it, will, it just proposed a bunch of objects in the, in the office kitchen at Google. That is like this coke can, um, this chip bag, some trash cans, and the, uh, and the yellow sign there. You can actually query with it all, all kinds of nature language inputs, object names. You can query the plant with like plant, potted plant, green plant, it's all fine. And it will be able to find that object. So this is a open vocabulary detection. This is a valid paper. So basically, um, if you know visual language models, um, basically we, this mo clip model can give you a likelihood score between text and the image describing, and the, the score describes how closely does the text describe the image. And then we build on that, this paper proposes open vocabulary detection where I combine uh, object proposal and we can query everything with text. For example, like for the crocodile there, we can query it with toy, green toy or toy crocodile, and it will be able to, uh, to, to estimate the likelihood score for that. So how can we ground planning with thing? So now the robot have navigating the thing, and I give an instruction called recycle the coke can. So what would actually do, just like humans, I would immediately have a list of items in my mind that I should kind of plan with. So, so, so somewhat like a establishing a planning domain, um, I propose this object, I might, this actually my skill might need a coke can and a recycle bin, and then because I already built this open vocabulary context, I'm able to find this location of the coke can and recycle bin in the thing, and how can I approach them? And then um, because I have this object, have, have these objects, uh, we can generate executable options. For example, let's say you, let's say you, 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 you can, the most naive way to do this is with templates that is for every object, I generate options that is go to something, pick up something, put down something. But you can actually also generate it with large language models as well if you have the skill to execute them. Um, so this is really powerful. For example, like I tried before on large, with large language models. If you just give it a few, few demos like we did like with the countries and the food and mountains before, you can let large language models to generate possible options. For example, for knife, you can generate like peel, cart, and the different types of options. That, uh, that, so it can get more powerful. Uh, then given all these options, we can do thing aware, context aware planning. That is what's available in the thing, what is not, and then I can, I can, I can, I can do this kind of planning. Sure. Oh, like available object? It's actually also done with large language models. I give it a few examples of like instruction followed by a list of objects involved. Instruction, a list of, of objects involved, and can propose it really reliably. 
for example, uh, when I, so we will be able to play with this at the end of the class, I think. So it is like, for example, I just give it, um, I don't know, like uh, throw the code can in the bin, you know, it's like code game bin. And then when it actually, it's really, really powerful because when I test it like with really weird wild task for a robot, for example, fill it a fish, it actually proposed cutting board, a knife, and a fish. So it's all about large language, prompting large language models here. Every single step can be done with large language models here. Except ex the executing this is why, why, why we still need to uh, carefully, uh, we, we need to start this class really hard because it is unsolved. <laughs> it's really hard. Then compared to Seiken, so uh, above it is Seiken where I use language models and value functions to find the most likely action among a fixed set of candidates. So what we can do here is that uh, we, we, can, we can actually propose executable options in this framework and uh, we, can, we can also use a forward, affordance as before and try to find the most plausible action among the candidates we generated. So although like the skills uh, we have is still limited, we, in, this, in this case we are, like, we are able to uh, expand the capability from a finite set of skills to infinite because now we can navigate to arbitrary objects. Previously, everything had to be card coded. Now, like in the Google Kitchen, I'm able to ask you to go to like, uh, ask you to find band-aids for me. I heard myself find some band-aids or find some medicine for me. It will propose I should go to the first aid station and, and then navigate there. This is options are, that are previously not available in the original SACAM paper, and we are doing that here. So, and you will be able to see this the- work a representation that will be later queried with natural language inputs. Sorry, uh, the embeddings I of should. this in query the all option stands with class agnostic detection. First, we run a scripted exploration algorithm with class agnostic detection and capture all clip features. We can also run a frontier exploration algorithm for any novel environment. So this, this is, is demo. The human gives an instruction. So this is one task that's not achievable by SACAM before because it, it just doesn't have a lot of, uh, doesn't have this concept of a brown, uh, uh, a woven basket in mind because it's not in their hard-coded list. And in, here I'm showing that it, with my new framework, it is able to achieve this task that's unachievable before. On multi-grain chips in the woven basket, the robot proposes two objects woven basket and brown multigrain chips to look out in the same representation. As visualized in the map at the bottom right, both objects are found and localized. The robot then plans and does a task by combining large language model and affordances as visualized on the top right corner. To watch an apple, the robot proposes three objects, apple, tap, and sink. Training a policy to wash items is beyond the scope of the project, so a simpler pick and place version of the task is demonstrated here. The robot correctly picks up the apple and puts it in sync. If we are unconstrained by available manipulation policies, we can lift the constraint on large language models, and then it will output steps like turn on the tab as next action. So yeah, and the last one is also water the potted plant. So all, this, all these tasks are previously unachievable by SACAN because they have to have a fin final list of objects while we don't here. So although this is really powerful, you know that we always need to bind available executable our actions to our language options. And that is one of the hardest challenge now. And I think it's, uh, exciting area of research. Once we can solve that problem, combined with this, we can actually have real everyday robots. And then there, there's one last paper which I'm going to go through very shortly. Basically, uh, with really powerful language models, you are able to like uh, synthesize programs and uh, you can execute them as programs. But I think we are running out of time and I hope to show everyone um, some, some interactive demos. For example, this is my chat GPT demo. This is a conversation model. So right here, I'm 
give me a step by step instruction to make Beijing Kao Ya. It's like deliberately confusing it by mixing two languages. And you know, and it kind of gave me this instruction. And you can ask a crazy thing. Someone even built a virtual machine inside it because it kind of you can seed it into something and can like gen generate like what's inside that directory, your home directory, and like you, you you do conversation with it, like a make directory, and it will output like a, a, a direct what's in the directory is uh, your newly created folder in it. It's really crazy. You should play with it. It's free. And then this is not free. I paid for a little bit for it. Um, so this is GPT-3. So here is what we actually used in, in second paper in my follow-up. So basically, I give it a bunch of uh, give give it a bunch of demonstrations. These are the few short examples. And before the class, I just tried bring me a banana from the banana launch, and it kind of generated the things. Although, like we like in the actual paper, we use a large, much bigger even bigger language models compared to, uh, to GPT-3 here. And like, I'm, like, in the context, I give like 10 demonstrations that has a great variety. Here it's just pick and place. But I think it's still really powerful. So what about, let's, let's try something. Let's let some students suggest something. Who want to suggest a task for it to plan? Instructions to fold laundry. Fold the laundry? I see. Is this a correct way to spell yeah. laundry? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, at least it says fold, but like in, yeah. I got the results on that. On chat GPT, okay. So I'm going, yeah. I asked step by step instructions. Yeah, you, you kind of need to, need to, you know, it's naughty and you need to prompt it to. <laughs> So yeah, this is a, just a most naive demo. Um, but with more templates, you'll be able to, if you give it more diverse demos, it will also be able to generate more diverse things as well. For example, here, you already know that I need to use the action fold. Okay, let's try something else. Uh, you can also type things like, I don't know, let's, let's try this. I'm thirsty, help me out. Ah. How about solve a Rubik's cube? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll probably ask you to find someone who know how to solve Rubik's cube. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, if you like coded this kind of skills with a trajectory planning algorithm, maybe yeah, I will be able to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, feel free to play with chat GPT. You can find all, all kinds of crazy stuff. What, what do you want to ask it? Yeah, 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 exactly. So one of my friends, like actually, who I asked for help from when I make, when I make this slide, he tried with chat GPT, and he asked it, first he asked it to make a dish that involves duck, and like chat GPT successfully gave him, uh, give him a list of uh, instructions. But then he tried to scan the, scan the chatbot by saying, uh, explain to me why, why, why is, why is that I can, um, I can uh, instead of using duck, I can use my uh, coat. <laughs> and like the, and the GPT, uh, the, the chat GPT actually gave him a, a bunch of uh, answers saying that because like uh, the coat it has like first and like, you know, like it's a valid alternative to duck to make this dish. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually, yeah, scam it. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to. Yeah. 
people can come up and play, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Feel free to suggest things and we can play with.